Episode five of the Wright County Restoration Project. We want to welcome you today to uh, the second part mm -hmm. of our First Amendment study in the Bill of Rights. Last time we were together, uh, we looked just at the first two clauses, as it were, of the First Amendment, often called uh, the Establishment Clause and the um, Free Exercise Clause. Right. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Absolutely. And we were there looking through uh, the various elements of what that means, what that looks like, got into history a little bit with Roger Williams, mm -hmm. um, and recognized a little bit of perhaps the scriptural foundation as well mm -hmm. as the historical foundation. Uh, by the way, I'm Jamin. This is Sam. Hey. And we are ready to go with our second week. So yeah. uh, as, as you thought through what we talked about last week, what was it that kind of stuck out to you or um, uh, any, any final thoughts on the first little bit of the First Amendment before we move on to the, the second part of it? Well, I think, you know, something that was really, really, really appreciated kind of going over kind of a, a brief history on Roger Williams and I think something to keep in mind as we're looking at this history mm. is to remember that to most of these men, in, in a sense, the, the Bible in the English language is a relatively new thing. Mm. And it's also, um, you know, even, even many of these political ideas, the people governing themselves, mm -hmm. people... Um, acknowledging that there are rights that God has given. All those things are, are really being put on paper and put into practice for the first time here as the Constitution is being laid out as, you know, and before that the Declaration of Independence and even before that with the Mayflower Compact and all those different things you have, you know, it, it hasn't been that long since Gutenberg came up with the printing press right. where you actually have Bibles available and then you have people like Tyndale and others translating the Word of God into the language of at least a, a portion of the population, the English-speaking portion of the population, and, and, and that becoming available to people. And so these, these times, we needed people like the Roger Williams and others as people are going through these growing pains of trying to separate out you know, what was church tradition and what actually are things that we get directly from the Word of God and actually interpreting yeah. the Word mm -hmm. of God for themselves. And so these are really important things, and we see them clearly laid out here in the First Amendment. And it all kind of stems, and, and a lot of the First Amendment things boils down to a freedom of conscience sure. in that. And that's a very important thing to the founders as well. Yeah, and this is something that in the Western world had not been understood for quite some time as we think of the right. Middle Ages and and the nature of the 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 really the what the printing press did to open up information. Mm -hmm. And we might very well liken it to what the internet has done. Right. To to free information from a, a small group of people and democratize information mm -hmm. as it were, the printing press uh, particularly as the printing press was able to be distributed and the technology was increasing, um, led to a tremendous increase in knowledge mm -hmm. um, and an increase in accessibility to knowledge uh, that to that point uh, it had, well, the world had never really seen. Right. And uh, there perhaps were other times in history where there were said uh, similar increases due to various um, societies and how they operated, but certainly nothing that the Western world had seen right. um, for hundreds of years at, mm -hmm. the, at the very least. Absolutely. And we were talking as well last week, uh, just briefly about uh, afterwards, mm -hmm. um, about how we think of men like Roger Williams. And, and when, when we think of the founders, we think of them as, as visionaries, mm -hmm. and we think of them as those who are kind of uh, on the, at the tip of the spear. And yet, uh, simultaneously, what we what we recognize from history is the founders are now uh, elevated as as 
um, these men, and rightfully so. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, they are they were they were men of virtue. They were men of of tremendous education, and they were men uh, who did a, a fantastic and a great thing. Um, but it came at uh, they, they they also stood on the shoulders of giants. Absolutely, yeah. um, they stood on the shoulders of men, and some men who like a Roger Williams, who mm-hmm. gets kicked out of his home, who gets uh, banished, uh, exiled, as it were, out of Boston, out of Massachusetts Bay Colony, and into the wilderness. And uh, there were men who, uh, no, all civilizations are built on suffering. Right. All civilizations are built on, uh, built by those who are willing to forge those mm-hmm. first steps. Uh, courage, really, right? Mm-hmm. Civilizations Absolutely. are built on courage. Um, civilizations are also maintained mm-hmm. by courage. And I think that that's something that stood out to me last week as we even just breach into this First Amendment is um, whether we're thinking about Roger Williams, some 100 years before the Declaration of Independence, mm-hmm. or whether we're thinking about the Declaration and the men that, that signed it and, and their fates, or whether we're thinking about the Constitution and, and the, the hard line that some of the states had to put down with this Bill of Rights. Um, Moral courage yeah. was really the order of the day that that kept the, this ball rolling, mm-hmm. and that established what was necessary to preserve the necessary protections to establish what is now a 250-year-old republic and the freedoms that we enjoy today. Absolutely. Well, and we're going to continue uh, with the next part of the First Amendment, and mm-hmm. really, we we might say the whole First Amendment is a, a well. We might say the entire Bill of Rights is a a check on authoritarianism, right? And yet we really see that in the First Amendment, Second Amendment, and specifically the second half of the First Amendment. We 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 see um, any number of ways in which, uh, um, no doubt, the experiences of the founders and the recognition of other attempts at republic and attempts at governments. Maybe even going back to thinking through the Magna Carta and the right. way that it, it was received. Um, mm-hmm. It's really one of the, the, the by experience, important elements of checking authoritarian rule mm-hmm. um, in these things. So That's let's go ahead and just briefly read through. We'll, we'll do the entire First Amendment again, and then I'll, I'll uh, hand good. it over to you for some comments. So First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We talked about those last mm-hmm. week. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So let's stick to that second. uh, There there are three uh, bodies here uh, separated by semicolons. Mm -hmm. You have the first two clauses, semicolon, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, semicolon. So let's talk about this concept, the freedom of speech and the press. Yeah, and I think... You know, it's interesting having, um, you know, we went through the Declaration of Independence Mm. earlier on. And it's interesting because you can see in these, each one of these really was something that we can find in that list of grievances Mm. in the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the... the king and his his governors and and judges and people that he was sending to the colonies was not you know acknowledging their ability to peaceably assemble right. and to govern themselves in in these assemblies whether it was their own little congresses or house of burgesses or whatever groups that they were doing those were being disbanded their charters were being taken away mm-hmm. and then also um, there was definitely things you could and couldn't say. And it's interesting that even after this happens and we see, especially in the uh, James Madison's presidency, this gets tested pretty pretty hard because you have um, many dissidents and rabble-rousers and people coming out of the French Revolution, mm. coming into America and printing what to the, the very God-fearing colonists was almost blasphemous ideas Mm -hmm. were being printed and so it's interesting that you know it still gets tested but that there is that freedom of speech a freedom to you know and and that's also coupled with a freedom of assembly that you can have groups in the community can get together they can talk about things they can talk freely about things without fearing retribution from the government and that these are things that we see as 
rights, not that the government delegates to us, as mm -hmm. we've said before, but as rights that the government is supposed to keep their hands off of and actually protect those rights. Um, they're not something that's delegated by the government. Yeah, and you, you touched on some important things there. One of the things that, that I marvel about when I think about particularly this freedom of speech, of the press, of assembly, of the uh, redress of grievances, is that even among civilized nations today, uh, you think of Canada and, and Great Britain, France, and, and of course any number of civilized nations, um, they don't have. Yes. They don't have in their constitutions and documents a actual freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Mm -hmm. These are things which it seems in the world are almost only in existence to the extent to which these countries respect and fear the United States of America yeah. and our founding documents. Uh, the other these, these countries, they cannot point to a document that mm -hmm. says, look, the government is restrained from abridging my freedom or my right to say these things. And that's, that is somewhat startling to think about Absolutely. really. Um, that, that we, we, and, and what a privilege right. that we are in this place, which is so unique mm -hmm. in the freedom that we have. Something else that you mentioned, which uh, I think is very important, is that these rights, um, particularly the ones that we're considering today, uh, but also the freedom of religion, they do come with inherent dangers. Yes. When you open up, and we talked about this a little bit last mm -hmm. week with some of the, the dangers of opening up freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. When you open up these freedoms, you are opening the door to error. Yes. You're opening the door to blasphemy. You're opening the door to things which you, we don't want in our society. Right. And yet when you weigh in the balance, uh, the, the dangers of authoritarianism, giving people the right or giving governments the right to say what you can and can't say, mm -hmm. trusting them to make the right decision, when you weigh that in the balance to allowing things uh, on the federal level, Right. And this is an important thing to remember. This is just restrictions on the federal government. This mm -hmm. does not necessarily speak to um, the, the nature of, of how... Uh, and we, we've we've allowed these things to filter down to where if if an individual community is is abrogating the Bill of Rights there that that can get to the Supreme Court and such. Right. But simultaneously, these are intended to be checks against the federal government's power mm -hmm. to, in a federal way, um, and we we saw that last week with the very beginning of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law, right? right. So this right. is saying that Congress shall not make laws which are abridging uh, the ability to for for a person to to say what he needs to say, and and we we're in a bit of a debate about that in our society today. Yes. What can a private corporation mm -hmm. allow or not allow? And uh, of course, we have the things with social media and and the platform versus the publisher idea, right. where um, if you're a platform, then you need to allow everything. If you're a publisher, then you can decide. Right. What gets in your paper? What gets in your what? What gets put in in your? You get to decide what's published because you're the publisher. Right. And then in private businesses, if you want to say you can't say these things and you can say those or you can't wear this and you can wear that, these are things which, as a general rule, uh, the United States has always allowed individuals, private businesses, and uh, even in in history, states and localities to mm -hmm. make decisions on. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's. You know, those, it's it's that tear between, you know, but I think, like you were saying, with, you know, giving this kind of freedom to people, and it's not it's not necessarily even, it, it's not given, given as given right. by government, but, but, but acknowledging those things is a dangerous thing. And it, and, it, and it has, you know, even something that we would see, you know, terrible like the burning of the flag or something of right. that nature there still is it is better to live in a country where those things are allowed mm -hmm. and that as long as you are peacefully assembling and demonstrating and letting your voice be heard in the public square um, even if that that voice is is vulgar and is something that is is hard for others to hear it is better to have a country where those that that is allowed, right? Than to have a country where they pick winners and losers, or they pick what speech is okay and what speech isn't okay. Like you were saying, other countries even today. I mean, we there's been several cases of 
comedians or others saying mm -hmm. certain things, posting certain things on social media, and actually going to jail right. for cert for a decent time because there is not the freedom of speech in Great Britain or these other places still to this day. Right, and we see in Canada pastors being uh, fined or put in jail for hate speech because Absolutely. they preach the Bible and they preach right. the things that the Bible says. And uh, this is something which the First Amendment uh, at this point protects me from mm -hmm. as I get up in the pulpit and I tell people what the Bible says and, and then I interpret it according to my freedom of conscience. And, and of course, this brings us back to the nature of um, a self-governed people. Right. That the, the documents that we have in place are really only fitted for people that are able to govern themselves because, and again, we're seeing a little bit of this today, as a people fail to govern themselves, these documents actually do become unwieldy. Mm -hmm. They become a liability more than an asset when uh, a, a people are so unrestrained in morality and in conscience that they are uh, thus compelled um, to say things that um, are, are so beyond the pale or to do things that, that are so uh, beyond decency that then there has to be some sort of measure of, of restraint upon them because there is no personal restraint within right. them. Right, absolutely. And as I connect these things to the Bible, uh, my mind went to Jeremiah. Hmm. Um, Jeremiah was an interesting prophet. We see now, if, if, if we were to trace, we look at Jesus' teachings, and, and uh, Jesus uh, tells the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which of the prophets did your fathers uh, not persecute? And we recognize that there was a trend of persecution Absolutely. of particularly Old Testament prophets mm -hmm. in the Bible. You read it in, in the Judges, you read it in, in the Kings and the Chronicles. And Jeremiah was a unique one, uh, lived throughout many of the kings uh, toward the end of the days of Judah, which was the southern tribe, uh, uh, the southern kingdom of, of the, the, the um, divided kingdom where Israel had the northern ten tribes and, and Judah was the southern two tribes. And, and Israel had already gone into captivity some hundred years before into Assyrian captivity, and Judah was on the cusp. They were getting close. Jeremiah would actually live to see that captivity play mm -hmm. out. And in Jeremiah, Jeremiah was preaching messages, and he was being rejected. Um, but he wasn't just being rejected by the people. There were times where it seemed as though perhaps a glimmer of his message was starting to cut through. But it would always kind of devolve back into this anger mm -hmm. among the people. And we see in Jeremiah 18, Jeremiah gives a message speaking about the nation being torn down. And basically what Jeremiah was doing is he was telling the people in Jerusalem, you are going to be, go into captivity, you are going to be destroyed. And of course, um, this is bad for morale. Absolutely. If you're yeah. a king and you're trying to rally troops and you're trying to keep the people optimistic in the face of tough times, and you've got this guy who claims to be, who claims to represent a measure of divine authority mm -hmm. and who some people probably respect, and he's saying, you guys are toast because right. you're sinful. And the king doesn't, and, and the people don't want to change, but they also are being sinful. And in Jeremiah 18, 18, we read this. Then said they, and this would be the people who were listening to Jeremiah, come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us smite him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. And then eventually they would actually throw Jeremiah into a pit. They would throw mm -hmm. him into prison effectively, where they just completely abandon him because they were sick of hearing his words. And this is something which I'm protected from, mm -hmm. that I can go out into society and people may not like what I have to say. Yeah. People may not like the, the nature of my message, but they don't have the right to harm me Mm -hmm. They don't have the right to attack me. They have the right to ignore me. Mm -hmm. They have the right to stand up next to me and speak counter, a counter narrative. Right. But they don't have the right to harm me mm -hmm. for the words that I speak. And particularly the government does not have the right to stop me right. from saying those things. And this is something, of course, which the prophets never had. No. It was not in Israel. God did not necessarily establish this idea itself in the mm -hmm. law. But what the founders no doubt understood is that had there been 
this freedom, a freedom which God desires naturally and mm-hmm. that he sent the prophets, right. the prophets would have had a better time <laughs> yeah. being able to share their message. Absolutely. So we, we've talked a little bit about freedom of speech. Let's talk about freedom of the press. Hmm. And mm-hmm. uh, they're very similar, but, but what's, what's kind of the nuance of difference between speech and the press? Well, to me, I see that there is definitely, you know, the press holds a little more sway, a sure. little more, a little more, you know, to take the time to put words on paper or now on a digital format yep. takes takes some more time. But it's also an interesting thing that it's a way of spreading a message. Mm-hmm. Um, we see that through various pamphlets and things that were kind of distributed, how the Federalist Papers and other things were distributed um, during the time of the founding. Mm-hmm. And, and before that, we see uh, the printing press being used primarily to to print the Word of God mm-hmm. in, as it was being translated and then in different iterations. And and it was a very powerful, powerful tool. And like you said, it was very much like like in our day, the Internet, right. where it's it, the idea of having that kind of, number one, having the ability to have something printed that you can can read was a big deal because before you have the printing press, everything's handwritten. Right, and so that, and you couldn't make things on mass. Right, it was it was painstaking. Yeah. It took and and so it was something only the wealthy and the aristocracy could even get their hands on. Um, and so people number one didn't read, so it was a way of keeping down the population. They didn't you just you didn't read because right. you know getting reading material was was impossible for mm-hmm. the common man. And then once you have the ability not only to read, but also to have that written material, it becomes, um, it allows people to think for themselves. Right. And so, and it also allows the spreading of various ideas as men read, as they study different different philosophers, different teachers, um, whether they're talking about political systems, whether they're talking about the way government should be. Hmm. Um, you know, even if we look into more recent history, you know, one of the biggest um, tools that even the Communist Party used throughout Russia and then later on Maoist China was printed material in yeah. mass propaganda. spread throughout those. And, and we yeah. would say, yeah, it's propaganda, but they are using the press in that way and it's a very powerful tool that yes the freedom of speech is important but taking that speech in a sense writing it down distributing it all over is is a very powerful thing and it can be used for good but it can also be used for great evil yeah and we're in a very interesting time in our society when when we think about the press the the uniqueness of the protection would be one would think it would kind of boil down to this idea that there were these unique and exclusive mechanisms for distribution mm-hmm. that not everybody had. Right. And so you have the press, and they have this printing mm-hmm. capacity, a, a printing capacity. You know, they, that people didn't have printers in their house, right? right? They couldn't just go and print whatever they wanted. And so you had this institution, and this institution was filled with civilians. Mm-hmm. And uh, until not too long ago, we would see the press as... Um, kind of a blue collar job mm-hmm. where it's not something uh, now people go to school for journalism and they tend to be among what we call the elites and mm-hmm. yet at the time it was people who didn't really like power and it was a strong civilian check right. on government power that this was a way to distribute material that was outside of the government narrative mm-hmm. or the government mm-hmm. talking points and uh, a, a true civilian check on authoritarianism and on government power and on government narrative. Mm-hmm. I wonder how this is going to play out in our time because we, we, we've made this correlation between the press and the internet and we see that that mainstream press has effectively, um, compl- has, has effectively become an arm of the government uh, and not even really an arm of the government, an arm of, a, of, of an ideology, we would say. Right. And right. Um, so it, it has become, it's lost its credibility in, in a very large way and we see the internet to a large degree taking over and yet the internet's a, a different beast mm-hmm. because that mechanism is available to almost anyone. Right. And so now we don't have, we have the next level of democratization where the printing press was in the hands of a few mm-hmm. 
Um, and now we see the printing press, as it were, the, the modern digital printing press in the hands of anyone. Yes. And I think that this is leading us to some degree to a bit of a crisis mm -hmm. on this First Amendment, particularly as it relates to the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. Um, you know, the term fake news is bantered around like crazy. Um, it, it has become frustrating mm -hmm. that it is nearly impossible to know what's true. Right. And one would almost wonder how it is that the that the First Amendment operates in the context of this digital revolution that we find ourselves in. And I'm not asking you for answers to that today. Just more of a, a little <laughs> bit of a discussion, as it were. Food but for thought. Um, it, it's been interesting to me to kind of think through that and to mm -hmm. wonder what is the future of these freedoms in this wholly democratized system um, where the printing press is effectively, I mean, it's not just in everyone's homes as it relates to a printer, right. but it is quite literally a zero a, a zero dollar investment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, outside of the, the initial investment of a computer and, and, and an internet connection to disseminate information. Yeah. Um, anyone can have a platform, even people that, um, quite honestly, maybe shouldn't have one in a sense. Right. Right, and it's and it's a mix of what you talked about earlier, where people are becoming less and less self-governing, right, and the unchecked liberty that the internet gives for someone, and and the technology is becoming easier and easier to make something look slick and right. and real and and look very appealing and very convincing when the information that's being transmitted just isn't true. And then you also have the, the, the society clashing as to what is true. Right. And is there truth? And yes. so we have multiple, because we're, we're facing a moral crisis and a, uh, and a industrial cri or a, a digital crisis, a, 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 a manifold increase mm -hmm. in technology, a technological crisis at the same time, we find ourselves in a unique place yeah. where um, the moral crisis, we don't have the moral fabric to guide ourselves through the technological crisis mm -hmm. in which we find ourselves. And the techno technological crisis is adding to the moral crisis. Right. Uh, so it will be very interesting to see how, but, but we, can, we can rest assured of this thing. Um, liberty would be the best solution. Yes. That if yep. man could govern themselves and so liberty could win out, that would be ideal, mm -hmm. where man would be able to continue to govern himself and authoritarianism would not be able to rule the day. And that's something which our documents establish for us. And, and, and if, uh, if that is going to go away, it's going to have to be through quite a fight. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's go ahead and talk through this last little bit here. The right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Um, these seem to kind of be paired together mm -hmm. if we look at the mm -hmm. semicolon placement. So it seems as though the mind of the founders tried to pair petitioning to a redress of grievances or, excuse me, assembling yes. to, the, to the petitioning. Um, not, necessar not necessarily perhaps in their mind any assembly, although maybe a fine interpolation sure. or extrapolation. But um, let's talk a little bit about this last clause here. Yeah, I think the you know it's interesting to look, especially the the right to petition. Mm. Uh, that's something that um, is is something that we don't talk about as much anymore. And it's interesting that all of these have have very even if we don't understand or don't feel like all of these rights as we keep continuing on through the the different amendments, we, maybe we don't feel like some of them apply to us or sure. apply to us right now, they're still very important to preserve and to stand up for, for other people's rights. But it's interesting, um, so John Quincy Adams, who was the son of John Adams, the second president of the United States and the, the one of the kind of founders of the, the Declaration of Independence. Mm. Um, so John Quincy is, is really known as, he's known as the hellhound of abolition. He is one of the people that he, in, in his time in, in Congress, really fights to, to end slavery. But he's also, at, his, at the point he's there, the House is about 80% 
um, pro-slavery. Hmm. So he's very much outnumbered. But he uses this right to petition and brings petition after petition until they actually go to the rules committee and and pass an order saying you can't bring petitions about slavery anymore, <laughs> um, specifically trying to keep him quiet, which is, you know, the, the government has used different rules and things to keep people quiet, right. you know, even back then. And so, but he... He, he used the, the petition, and, and in the sense that petition was people could go to any of their, their legislatures or, or their, you know, their local senator, your representative, and, and bring, if a, if a group of them felt something was important, they could bring a petition to that person, and that person, at least the way that, that John Quincy Adams saw it, was, was then duty bound to mm. present that before before Congress. And I mean to the point where John Quincy Adams brought a petition asking for the removal of John Quincy Adams from the House. Um, he was that passionate about it that he, that people back in his home area, at least enough of them wanted to get rid of him that he presented that on the floor of floor of Congress. And of course it didn't go anywhere, but it was interesting that he, he believed enough in the integrity yeah. of of the this the that process that he would do that and and one of his his quotes is um duty is ours um the results are god's mm -hmm. as i think through this pairing of the right to assembly and the right to petition once again it kind of conjures up where we are right now in our society um we, we have that phrase, there's strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. And not just the idea that when a person sees a group of people, they see that there is a public sentiment, mm -hmm. but that when a, person, when, it, when a person joins a group of people, there's a measure of confidence that right. I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a nature of, of emboldening that takes place when I am among people who think the way I do and who agree with me to where, whereas I would feel helpless as a single person mm -hmm. sitting in a sea of people that are perhaps going in a different direction, when that single person has the freedom of speech with which to speak mm -hmm. and then finds within that, that freedom a group of people who agree, this is where the seeds of change can really begin to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, when a person can come, say what, what they want to say, and then have others join them right. in saying what what is being said, and then finding in that that cohabitation and, and emboldening an opportunity to share truth and even to refine truth. As we think about uh, the framing of the Declaration of Independence or or uh, the framing of the Constitution, these men gathered together and they refined it. They 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 brought the process together. They discussed and they 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 had a boldness together that maybe they would not have had. Mm -hmm individually. And once again, we see this throughout time that authoritarian regimes, one of the things that they want is registration of assemblies yes. and uh, limits to assemblies because within when assemblies grow, uh, that's where movements begin. Right. And this was something that the king did a very good job of trying to stop in mm -hmm. the colonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very raw wound, we might say, yeah, in absolutely. the colonies uh, as they became the United States of America. Um, that they wanted to make sure that if people needed to petition their government for a redress of grievances, that not only did they have the right to write a letter or mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to speak themselves, but to gather right. and in a peaceable manner to, to speak. Absolutely. This, of course, has also become extremely important for the church. Mm -hmm. uh, and this perhaps goes a little bit outside of the bounds. I, I'm, I'm not... I have not, um, uh, I'm not, not educated enough in, in the, the height and the, the width of exactly how far the founders intended this to go. There's probably a Federalist paper on it that I'm not remembering. But, um, but as we think through that idea that um, as a church, mm -hmm. I and my people have the right to come together. Mm -hmm. And we are peaceable and we're not uh, causing problems and we have the right to be here. And mm -hmm. um, this is a essential right for Christians Absolutely. as we would feel within the scope of our theology that we are walking contrary to the spirit of the world, uh, as the Bible would describe it, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And we have uh, chosen by God's grace to swim upstream. Mm -hmm. And as Jesus presents it, that is going to bring about a measure of difficulty. 
Absolutely. And so as we go through the week, we face these difficulties and these troubles and uh, what I often call uh, the, the desert of life. And then we come together uh, on the day of our choosing and the time of our choosing, and we're free to do so. And when we do, we, we, we get a little bit of an oasis, mm -hmm. a little bit of, uh, of, of coming together among friends, uh, a place of safety in the midst of what might otherwise be a struggle. Right. Uh, and this would also perhaps apply to the nature of a political grievance mm -hmm. where uh, people are in a system and there's something wrong with that system and um, they are thus struggling and then there are these times where they can come together among those who agree with them and they can peaceably seek a way to bring these desires to pass. We, we see this used particularly strongly in the civil rights movement, yes, uh, with Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. and uh, in contrast to say Malcolm X and some of the other uh, attempts at bringing about change, we find in the civil rights movement uh, the strong use of the right to peaceably assemble mm -hmm. and to petition their government for a redress of grievances. Yeah, and uh, it created a a monumental change. Mm -hmm. Some of it perhaps. Um, going a bit beyond its intended charter, but uh, that would be for another day, but a, a monumental change in the direction of this nation, and by and yeah. large, we would say, uh, for, for the better. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting to note on that point that we have seen many of these rights for a little time in different, different areas, even in our country, been abused, or yes. these rights have been taken away, you know, thinking during especially the abolition movement where presses were were destroyed and yeah. and there were you know abolition <clears throat> papers were were hunted down and destroyed because yeah. or you know kept out of the hands of certain people and and like you said the you know where we think of the the different situations with the civil rights movement where you know people weren't allowed to peacefully assemble and 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 they were still standing up for that, and and thankfully those you know these are, are rights that do need to be exercised, and sometimes the government won't recognize them the way they should. Right. But you know at least to this point, you know thankfully they are, are still in place and being recognized. And, and this is an important point that needs to be made as well. Um, we are finding some some we are finding various leaders right now who are stretching the bounds of some constitutional mm -hmm. um, liberties. And as you mentioned, um, this is not the first time. Right. You mentioned the destruction of abolitionist presses, and then we, we know that during the Civil War, mm -hmm. President Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. Absolutely. He jailed, he jailed uh, um, reporters, he, mm -hmm. uh, members of the press. He, he did a great deal to suppress anti-Civil War um, press. We know um, that FDR, of course, put Japanese in internment camps, mm -hmm. Japanese Americans who had rights, right. and they were suspended and put into internment camps. But each time we have seen, and then of course we recognize the tremendous injustices on African Americans Absolutely. and um, the, the nature of those injustices leading up to particularly the civil rights uh, movement, and yet the United States under the the direction of our founding document mm -hmm. has corrected itself yes and this is essential that these documents are robust mm -hmm. and these amendments are robust and we have seen other days where the liberties that we hold dear that we hold very dear today i mean the second amendment has never been used in the way it's been used in the last couple of decades as Absolutely. far as the actual collecting of arms <laughs> Um, the Second Amendment is, is experiencing a very strong uh, right. time, a very mm -hmm. powerful time. And as we think through all of this and, and times where that was not the case, times where you walk into a town and you have to turn your gun in right. when, you, when you step into the, the, the town and mm -hmm. you, can, you can have it on your way out. Um, and uh, as, we, as we consider this, we recognize the robustness, uh, uh, if that's a word, of, these do of this document mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the fact that the United States has been in, in, in difficult days before, and it has self-corrected. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, that is a, is a hopeful thing to, to realize when you do look at the, in the, in the scheme of things, brief history of America, but right. still there has been times of upheaval, times where these documents have not been followed, yep. and that things have, have corrected 
back to these documents and it sometimes takes time it yep. sometimes these these rights and freedoms get regulated and pulled back very quickly but then over time through the courts process through the people speaking out that things have brought been brought back to alignment with these documents and and there there will yet be more more situations where mm -hmm. and and where people need to to stand up and, and ask for this redress of grievances, which is interesting in that they, they specifically put in that asking for a redress of grievances, asking the government for an explanation and a righting of wrongs mm -hmm. that it has committed upon the people. And it's interesting that, you know, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, the next thing is the Second Amendment. Right. And that's what happened to these colonists. They, they brought these grievances to the king. He wasn't going to hear them. They brought it to the people around the king, to the people of Great Britain. Yep. They weren't hearing them, and and then they were left with nothing else but to turn to that, the the Second Amendment option, the the force of arms, yep. and in that sense, even you know, in the start of it, defending their own property, defending their own munitions and 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 towns mm -hmm. um, against what was the king's invading force at that point. Well, very good. And on that hopeful note, and it is a hopeful note, mm -hmm. we'll go ahead and finish up the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. And uh, next week, or next time at least, uh, hopefully next week, we will plan to um, step into the Second Amendment. Um, yes. Plenty to say there. Um, and we'll look forward to that. want to thank you for joining us today for mm -hmm. Episode 5 of the Wright County Restoration po uh, Project podcast. And we'll look forward to being able to talk with you again uh, very soon. Thank you, and pass along um, these these. Two. If you find these interesting and informative, pass them on to friends, family, anybody you think might be interested. Um, you know, share it, give us a like, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Very good.